So we'll go back to why May is my favorite month. First of all, it's my birthday, and so it's a birthday month. But secondly, I have fond memories of May when I was a little girl. Now remember, this is about 45 so years ago, and we went to this little church on the south side of Columbus, and the mother-daughter banquet was always held the month of May. Now, I went to this church, and, and the banquet was in the basement, and I grew up thinking that all church basements are supposed to have this small scent of kind of like sewer gas, okay? And so we would all come in for the mother-daughter banquet, and all the women would be dressed up, and the little girls would have on their lace anklets and their little white shoes and their little white gloves. There would be moms that would be wearing corsages, and then, of course, the tables would have those beautiful, gorgeous paper placemats. And we would have one of every color on every seat area. You remember that, don't you, Brenda? And then they would go ahead and they would serve the meal. And at our mother-daughter banquet, we had the same thing every year. It was a casserole called Chicken Delight. Don't know what was in that delight part. And there wasn't a whole lot of chicken. It kind of ran through quickly, but it was Chicken Delight. And then green beans, a salad, a roll, and then dessert. Dessert was always jello with fruit cocktail. <laughs> and all churches, I believe for sure that there was a salesman that went around from church to church to church <laughs> selling them the place settings that every church had in their kitchen back then because it was the light beige with the little brown sparkles in it and the coffee cups were about this size, enough for about two swallows. So I remember my grandma, my mom, and my aunt sitting around the kitchen table and I was a little girl, and my grandma was like, okay, who's all going to the mother-daughter banquet? And of course, my mom and my aunt would always say, mom, that's enough. We go every year. We have the same thing. We're not going to go. And my grandma would be insistent that her entire family, every female, would be at the table, and we would go. So then there was always the entertainment. Now, I can tell you the reason I have a warped sense of humor is probably due to the entertainment that happened at the mother-daughter banquets <laughs> as I was growing up. The ones I remember especially was the female ventriloquist that came with a little girl puppet sitting on her lap. That was a scary one. But then our very favorite was the button lady. She collected buttons. And for about an hour, she told us the origin of buttons. So that's, those are my favorite memories of the month of May. However, you know, <laughs> the, sco the social context and the way we as women relate to things have differed since then. We no longer wear corsages to church. The only hat I own is a baseball cap that I throw on on a Saturday mornings getting ready to go to breakfast. We don't celebrate and ask the oldest mom to stand up, the youngest mom to stand up, and the one with the most children to stand up. We've recognized that that can be sometimes offensive. Um, and we realize too, men, as much as we hate to admit this, that that, mo that role model that persona that we always try to emulate is that we were the perfect moms, we were the perfect women, and we had it all together. We want, don't want to admit this, but it's not true. We've recognized that we aren't perfect. Um, our culture's changed so much, and the role of women has changed so much today, that we have went from the backyard to the battlefield, We've went from the kitchen to women in the space shuttle. And we went from washing windows to breaking corporate glass ceilings. Now, don't get me wrong. There's nothing wrong with women who choose to be stay-at-home moms. What a wonderful calling and profession you have. However, sometimes in the Bible, when we look at a biblical woman, we look at Proverbs 31, 
and we say, this is the woman I'm meant to be. And all those character traits that they're trying to display in that scripture are great, but they're not really culturally relevant, the task that they mention in that scripture today. If you remember the scripture, um, in Proverbs 31, this is the woman that works with eager hands and brings food from afar. Now, in my world, food from afar is from the kitchen to the family room as we get caught up on the Netflix episode that we might be watching. Um, another uh, task is she rises while it's still night and makes food for all those in her house. My husband will tell you when he leaves early in the morning, he gets the morning grunt. And if he's lucky, I have set the coffee pot for him and it's went off. Otherwise, it's gas station coffee. Um, and then the other trait that they mention is that she makes coverings for her beds. Now, I don't know about you ladies, <laughs> the coverings on my beds came from the clearance rack off TJ Maxx. <laughs> okay? So, my husband sews on bet buttons better than I do and I use iron-on tape to hem my pants. <laughs> so I have a hard time relating to the tasks that are mentioned with the Proverbs 31 woman. So this morning I want to take a moment. I want to introduce you to a woman in the Bible that I believe demonstrates characteristics that we can still relate to today that are culturally relevant and, quite frankly, I think we can learn from. And not just the women here today, but I think even as men, you too would want to display these type of characteristics. So in the Bible, if you want to turn to me to Acts chapter 16, and we're going to start with verse 6. Now we're going to tear through this narrative a uh, piece at a time, okay? So just kind of bear with me. The scripture will be on the screen um, if that helps you. First of all, let's remember who wrote the book of Acts. That was Luke, okay? And we're going to begin with uh, verse 6. They went through the countries of Parisia and Galatia. The Holy Spirit kept them from preaching the word of God in the countries of Asia. When they came to the city of Mycenae, they tried to go on to the city of Bithynia, but the Holy Spirit would not let them go. From Mycenae, they went down to the city of Troas. Now, I want to make this story make a little bit of sense to you. So we're going to stop, and I just want to give you some context to know. First of all, when it says we, when Luke's writing, right now he's talking about Paul, Timothy, Silas, and himself. And they had one thing in mind during this time period. That was to preach the good news. And they wanted to be strategic about it. They wanted to reach as many people as possible. So to reach as many people as possible, they would look and say, what cities do we need to go to? Which ones have a dense population of people that may have not heard the gospel? So in their planning, they had decided that they needed to go into these cities, into Asia. But scripture tells us the Holy Spirit stopped them from going in to those areas. We'll go on. That night, Paul had a dream. A man was standing in front of him crying out, Come over to the country of Macedonia and help us. After he had seen this, we agreed that God told us to go to Macedonia to tell them the good news. Now, I want you to try to put yourself in Paul's situation right now. Have you ever had a dream where you're walking through a corridor or a narrow hallway and there's these doors on each side of you? And you try to open up a door, and it's locked. And then you go to this side, and you try to open up another door, and it's locked. And then you try another door, and you're like, I know I'm supposed to be going here. And every time I turn around, the door's locked, the door's locked, the door's locked. That's the type of situation they were in. In their heads, they were like, we need to go to these cities. This is where we need to go. But they kept trying on these doors, and it was locked. They couldn't get into that area. So, but then, it's like they get to the end of the corridor, and they're like, oh, we're supposed to go to Macedonia. How are we going to get there? You see, in their travels, where they were, they were, land, they were at the end of land, okay? They were here, 
God said, you're not going to any of these other cities, and they're looking at water. So now he, Paul's had this vision, this man saying, you've got to go to Macedonia. So as they get to the end of that corridor, our virtual corridor, the doors open. And lo and behold, there's a, a ship. Let's read on. So we took a ship from the city of Troas to the city of Samothracia. The next day, we went to the city of Neapolis. From there, we went to the city of Philippi. This was an important city in Macedonia. It was ruled by the leaders of the country of Rome. We stayed there for some days. On the day of rest, we went outside the city to a place down by the river. We thought people would be gathering there for prayer. So here they are after a ship ride over to Macedonia. They ended up at a river on the Sabbath in a town of Philippi that was under Roman rule. Now Paul knew enough that he knew that if there were believers, if there was a synagogue in this area, it was always going to be by water. It was going to be outside the city, and it was going to be by water because they needed that for ritual purification. So when he went to the river, who do you think he might be expecting to see? The man in the vision, possibly, right? Who called him? He had a vision, the man from it to say, come help us in Macedonia. But he gets there, and he sees women here at the river. You see, during this time period, if there were not 10 men in the city, there was no synagogue. So because there was no synagogue, they would meet at the river, and that would be their time to pray. So here's Paul and his gang, and we can tell... Um, by scripture, that when it says in verse 11, we, that Luke has now joined them, okay? So Luke is, Paul, is part of the gang, has joined them, and we know that Paul is thinking we need to be in Macedonia, and there's a man that's saying, come help us. We've gotten there. We've stayed there for several days. It's the Sabbath. We're going to the river, and who do I run into? A group of women praying. Let's keep going. One of the women who listened sold purple cloth. She was from the city of Thyatira. Her name was Lydia, and she was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to hear what Paul said. When she and her family had been baptized, she said to us, If you think I am faithful to the Lord, come and stay at my house. She kept on asking, and then we went with her. So who was this woman, Lydia? You know, this is the only place in Scripture where we get a glimpse of this woman. But this is what we know. First of all, we know that she's a dealer in purple cloth. We know that she came from the town of Thyatira, which was the center of the fabric and the dye industry in that day. We know that she's a woman who works outside of the home. She's a dealer of purple cloth. We know that she's a business owner. We know that she's a mother. And we know that she's a God-fearer. A God-fearer is a Gentile who has chosen to embrace Jewish custom, but not a Jew. And we know that she's not yet a Christ follower. So what characters, first of all, do we see in this woman's life? The first thing that I saw is a lady who is diligent. Notice that she's from Thyatira. She's in Philippi. There's a 250-mile span of land from there to Philippi. So most likely this woman, being a dealer, would go up and down the coastline, and she would sell her wares to other dealers, to retailers. This was a savvy businesswoman. Have you ever known a successful entrepreneur? When I think of the characteristics they have, I think of Lydia. 
They're usually creative. They have vision. No's typically not in their vocabulary. They're industrious. They're hardworking. And they have a plan. That was Lydia. Now, getting purple fabric was not easy during those days. Purple fabric was the fabric of the rich and famous. Okay, it was elite, and only the elite wore it. It was reserved for the emperor. The emperor was the only one that had a tunic that was made completely of purple. The cloth was so expensive because they had to extract the dye from shellfish. So what they would do is they would take the dye, they would get one drop, one drop of dye from shellfish. So they would actually take their, during the fall and their winter, they would continually collect these shellfish and they would keep them alive. So when they had enough, they would be able to dye a yard of this material that they would be able to sell. We could compare this probably to the most expensive cashmere that you could probably put your hand on today. I read something in one of the commentaries that this dye was equal to, value-wise, was equal to about 10 grams of gold. Can you imagine that? So this woman successfully dealt with exquisite materials, and we know that she was wealthy. She didn't get there by being lazy. We know that she maintains two homes. She has one in Thyatira, and she has one in Philippi. We know that her home in Philippi had to be quite large because not only was she living there, but her household was living there, which would include children, servants, parents possibly, grandparents, and she invited Paul and his gang to stay with her as well. Now, there is nothing wrong with being a savvy business person. Scripture tells us that we are to be diligent in our work. Whether we're a stay-at-home mom or a corporate CEO, maybe we're a service provider of some sort, we're to be del diligent in our work. Now, does diligent mean that we're going to spend a massive amount of overtime? Or we're going to focus on the money? Absolutely not. Diligence, I believe, is working smart and not hard. It's having a plan and maintaining a focus. Have you ever had one of those days where you had a task at hand, but you just can't seem to get it together? Okay, you've heard from me speaking, we are in perpetual remodel mode in our house at all times. There's always a project going on, okay? So the past 30 years that we've been married, we've been in this perpetual remodel mode. Right? No matter what house we live in, we're remodeling something. So it's the big joke in our household that it is not a project until you have made three trips to Lowe's to get it accomplished. <laughs> now, we are getting better after 30 years. We are down to two trips to Lowe's before that project is accomplished. But Lydia was diligent. She had a plan, and she knew what she was doing as a businesswoman. And that was quite obvious because of her success in what she was doing. Lydia, she was also devout. That's another characteristic I see here. With all that this woman was trying to juggle, her family, her business, her households, two homes, she probably worked six days a week, where was she on the Sabbath? She was at the river. She was praying. She was with other believers. She was committed not only to her providing for her material needs, she was devout in taking care of her spiritual health. I wonder if we're as committed to taking care of our spiritual health as we are our material wealth. That challenged me really looking at this scripture this week. 
Another characteristic of Lydia that I admire is she was devoted. I want you to notice that when Paul and the others went to the river, they expected to see other believers there. But they expected, Paul was thinking, he was looking for a man. Now, guys, no pun intended here, not a problem that, he was, that his vision was of a man because God's purpose always comes through. His plans always make a way, right? But here they went to a river and they saw this woman. I'm sure Paul was looking around wondering, is this man going to show up? But yet, here he is. He's speaking to this group of women. And here's Lydia. She leaned in. She listened. When she heard the stories of the Messiah and how they were prophesied in the Old Testament, because she was familiar with the Old Testament. She was a God-fearer, remember? She had embraced Jewish thought, Jewish traditions, even though she wasn't a Jew. She knew Paul was speaking the truth. And because of that, she knew that this was truth. She had a discerning spirit, and she opened her heart. The Bible says that the, the spirit of Jesus spoke to her. She was devoted to her spiritual growth. Not only did she plan for her material wealth, she was continually working on her spiritual health as well. So after being obedient to the Spirit, she embraced Jesus. And then she her showed her devotion immediately. First, she was baptized. Immediately. She and her household were baptized. Her household must have trusted her and followed her because she was a devoted woman with incredible character. What I absolutely love about Lydia is that after her baptism, if you look at scripture, it says, she urged us, if you consider me a believer in the Lord, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. This is a woman that wouldn't take no for an answer. I love that about Lydia. She was so devoted. Have you ever been over someone's house and they're like, oh, just have dinner with us. And you're like, oh, no thanks, it's all right. And they're like, no, no, really, sit down. We want to share a meal with you. No, it's okay, I'm full, you know. No, it's important. You're going to sit down, like my grandma going to the mother-daughter banquet, right? Okay, no, you're going to go to the banquet, okay? It's important that we're all together. Here's Lydia. If you believe that I'm a follower of Jesus now, come, stay at my home. And they're probably going, no, come on, you just met us. And she's like, no, we're, we're family. We're family now. I'm a believer. Come, come. She was persuasive. She knew what she wanted to accomplish, and she did it. You know, nowhere in Scripture is Lydia mentioned again. She's not one of the well-known ladies of the Bible. She wasn't like the adulterous woman at the well that we all know about. She didn't build an ark. She didn't carry the Savior in her womb. But the impact that this woman made for the cause of Christ is astounding. This is what I want you to think about. Her hometown, Thyatira, was in the region that the Spirit would not allow Paul to enter. Now, if you would flip over, and you don't have to do this right now, you can take my word for it, or you can look it up later, to Revelation chapter 2, verse 18, there's a letter written. Guess what the name of the church is that that letter is written to? The church of Thyatira. Someone started a church in that area. We have no knowledge of who it was. We don't know if it was Paul or not at a later date. But I have a hard time believing that the character of Lydia, that incredible diligence and devotion and faith and commitment that she showed, that she certainly had an impact, if not being the one that introduced the gospel to her hometown in the city of Thyatira. See, nowhere in Scripture 
Are we going to find the answer? Yet God has used women of character all through history to make profound impacts. Secondly, Lydia is known as the first convert to Christianity in Europe. And although there was really no established church in Philippi at the time of her conversion, if you look back to verse 40 in the same chapter of Acts, chapter 16, when Paul and Silas, they had entered into jail, when they were released from jail in the city of Philippi, guess where they went? Back to Lydia's home. Does that just amaze you? And it makes me think, is this the first church in Philippi? And if you look at our New Testament, there's a book of the Bible, and it's called Philippians. And you know what it is? It's a letter that Paul wrote to the church in Philippi when he couldn't be there. This Lydia, this, Lydia, this woman, made a major impact on the people in which she came in contact with daily. Lydia's life is a strong example how God will use the diligent, the devout, and the devoted to further his kingdom. That's the kind of character traits I want to display in the world. It doesn't matter if I bought my bed coverings off the clearance rack at TJ Maxx. <laughs> it doesn't matter if the longest journey I make for the food for my family is from the kitchen to the family room. But am I going to display the characteristics of diligence and being devout, being committed to the cause of Christ and being devoted to share his word with every person that I meet that God gives me the opportunity to share with? That's the characteristic. That's the woman I want to be this Mother's Day. So in closing, I just want to encourage all of you, have an absolutely wonderful day. Stay away from all chicken delight. <laughs> and let's remember those three words this week. Let's be diligent, let's be devout, and let's be devoted. Thanks.